And now their supplies are not easy detectable. I mean, they're underground, right? So you have to go to all these uh, firefight in the tunnels. You know, many of their depots were uh, underground in two or three levels of underground. Um, from time to time while I was in Vietnam, because I wasn't a very big person, right, right. Um, I went into the tunnels. Uh, but I stopped doing that after uh, uh, I, uh, an incident in, uh, gosh, uh, in the maybe February, March of uh, 1970. Um, I ran into an enemy there and um, we struggled. Yeah. So um, by the time I got to Cambodia, I really didn't think I was going to go home. And my attitude then was to make it, make things as difficult for the enemy mm -hmm. before they, as I could before they got me. Right. So I did go into a tunnel again. Okay. And uh, uh, I just put one episode in the book, but I did several. Several. Uh, okay. I found an arms factory mm -hmm. about 30 feet right. below the surface. Uh, they just made rifles right there on wow. the spot. Okay. Uh, the part I put in the book was uh, when I found um, an underground hospital complete with uh, uh, operating rooms, surgical lights, uh, medicine, EKG machine, x-ray. The whole deal was there. Right, right. Uh, fortunately, no one was home. No one was home, yeah. yeah. Now, in your book, you talk about very close to death experience inside the tunnel when it was so dark that the only thing that you could feel was your enemy's breath mm -hmm. and then you got into a life or death struggle with this enemy that you don't even see can you can you tell us a little more about that life-changing experience when you go into a tunnel there's some things you just have to uh, you have to keep in mind um, first of all, it's best not to turn on a light. If you have a flashlight, you only use it rarely. I mean, if you're really, really sure you're uh, alone. Right. And it's going to be dark, so you, you live by your senses. What you can feel, what you can hear, what you can smell. So when you go into a tunnel, the best thing to do is to try to touch as much of the ceiling and the wall and the floor as you can. There are trap doors in there. And if you miss a trap door, somebody would come up behind you with a big iron spike and just nail you to the floor. So, you know, you really want to make sure you know what's going on in there. Um, and you need an imagination. Right. What am I feeling? Is this part of the tunnel and intersection mm -hmm. or not. And so what happened then was uh, I got to an intersection mm -hmm. and I thought, well, if I turn left or right, if I go, you know, in this intersection, uh, chances are that somebody will get behind me and this mm -hmm. is not what you want. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the tunnel and I was behind this person, but they could get around the corner and wait for you. Right. And, you know, the tunnels are small. Um, at times, your shoulders can touch both walls at the same time. It's like having an alley fight in a sewer pipe, which is really what happened. Um, I thought I heard someone, and so I just laid there for a while. And one of the other things you do in tunnel fighting is you do your first killing as quietly as you can, which means with a knife or with your hands, because if you fire a gun, then everybody knows you're there, and they, they will come for you. So as I eased to the, um, you know, tried to ease around the intersection, um, I smelled nakmam. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing I knew, I got hit on the side of the face, and uh, I've lost my knife. 
so then we had, you know, we had this, this struggle, and uh, I managed to get the advantage and uh, crush this soldier's larynx, and uh, then I got out. Right. So um, that was, you know, the reason why I stopped going in the tunnels. Yeah. yeah. And then by June of 1970, I thought, you know, I've gone ten and a half months in Vietnam, kept myself mostly in one piece. Right. Right. And now I'm going into Nguyen's house, and Nguyen's got an AK, and he's going to be really upset. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, well, okay, I'm not getting out of here, so I might as well just make it difficult for them. So that's that's why I started doing the tunnel stuff again. Well, tunnel is tunneling is very dangerous. How were you assigned for, to this duty? Does it mean you get to go home sooner, or you just? want to do it because something that, that you feel you get, you're good at. The first time uh, I went in the tunnel, I was kind of assigned to it, but I knew I didn't really have to go. Okay. Uh, I was sitting on a break by the trail, and this tree just rose up out of the ground. It was actually a tree that was in a burlap bag, and it was a tunnel entrance. It was disguised. And this guy put the tree aside, climbed out put the tree back in the hole, and walked away, and I thought, no, I didn't see that, and the first sergeant saw it also, and he was, you know, gave me a hard time for not shooting the guy, and he said, well, you can make amends, you go down there and see what else is there, so, uh, I thought, well, no, maybe, so I went the first time. As a dare. Um, to try to get this guy off my back. Actually. Right, right. But, um... No one, we knew you didn't really have to do it. There was a unit of official tunnel rats in Saigon that was started around there, so they would, uh, they got into the tunnels at Kuchi, that's a very right, famous right. place. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, officer who started that unit, mm -hmm. uh, and he, he named them tunnel rats because there's rats in the tunnels also, uh, he would not recruit. Um, African American men for that unit. He said that we lacked the courage and the skill to do the job. No, no. Yeah, I did. Uh, total fabrication because there were a lot of black men who went in the tunnels. I also went, you know, because sometimes you can find some really good food in there. <laughs> <laughs> for the loot. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yes, in the, end, in the monsoon, the helicopters didn't show up all the time, and you could go four or five days between meals. And yes. if you find a tunnel, you know, that's one of the things tunnels were for, mm -hmm. is to store stuff. Right, so, right. Go down there. So they're not, they're not man all the time. They would just be like a random station where the enemy can pick up their supplies. and okay. Exactly, all right. exactly. Uh, sometimes uh, they would shoot at the Americans and then disappear into a tunnel and come out two miles away. Right, right. So from your description, the war was pretty brutal, and, um, and you lived through it. But the thing that I found from your book is that um, you found humor a big part of your survival instinct. And I love your story about the eating the sea rations. Can you tell me more about the, the story about eating the sea rations? Sea rations stand for canned food. The issue with sea rations, the first one is that there's only 12 different meals. So three meals a day in four days, you've gone through the year's menu. Uh, that's really awesome. <laughs> the next thing you have to know is that many of those sea rations were put in the can sometime in the 1940s. This is all a World War II surplus. Older than you were. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, there, there are only a, a few things that were really, I consider, edible. Uh, canned ham and eggs was not on the list. It looked really looked like somebody had vomited in the can and sealed it. I just I could not hold that stuff down. Yeah. The best meal they called it re-up food. You know, like people would, would uh, re-enlist in the army to get this was the beans and franks. Yes. Beans and Winnie's was really good stuff. Uh, and you could get pound cake, 
and a little can of peaches. That yeah. was just, that was heaven. All right. The rest of it was awful. <laughs> we did start to get these dehydrated rations. They're the uh, forerunner of uh, the current Army's uh, MREs, Meal Ready to Eat. Right. This stuff is just, it wasn't really good either. Um, the chili and uh, chili and beans, mm -hmm. chili with beans. The beans were still hard, no matter how long you soaked them in water, they were still, they were still hard. So one day, just out of boredom, <laughs> I took the uh, pellets out of one of the shells in my grenade launcher, uh, rather big shotgun shells, and I loaded it with beans. <laughs> I actually took a man down with, uh, uh, with beans instead of buckshot. <laughs> Wounded them enough, we grabbed him and, you know, put him on a helicopter and sent him off to the, uh, to the hospital and, and for later, later on for interrogation, I, you know. <laughs> I can't imagine how he explained it. That's great. That's a really funny story. So, could you tell us more about humor uh, play a part in your survival during this experience? Well, you know, infantrymen get a really warped sense of humor. We were, my platoon was left behind at a, uh, a burned over landing zone. And they couldn't get everybody out. Most of the company got out before nightfall, and so they left our guys uh, overnight uh, at this place where a helicopter had crashed and there had been a fight over the equipment, etc. You know, there's, there's at least two good machine guns on every helicopter. Right. right. And uh, there were skulls, and, you know, skeletons laying around there. So when we got uh, picked up the next morning, one of my friends brought a skull with him. And we went straight from the landing pad to the bar, to the EM club. And uh, this guy, had, a, he had a, his name was Richie. He had a really good sense of humor, kind of warped like the rest of us. And... He set this skull on the bar, and it looked like it had three eye holes, right? Yes. And he said, two beers, one for me and one for my friend here. I just like, terrified poor little Bart. <laughs> <laughs> so we were left to uh, ten bar for ourselves. Um, guys who had not had a bath in probably three months. Um, we were pretty ripe, you know, yeah, and yeah. we just decided to have a party. Uh -huh. um, the party, you know, got broken up, so we went and sat out in the rain and watched movies. The uh, movies they showed us were usually John Wayne cowboy and Indian things, right. and so, you know, we'd always go and root for the Indians. Right. The Arvin guys thought the Indians were the Viet Cong, and it was just really goofy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just, you had to laugh at the situation. Right, right. right. Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, most American we get our information or misinformation about the Vietnam War through movies. And I'm mm -hmm. so glad you wrote this book where you, you were able to recount your first-hand experience. But personally, for you, was this, writing this book, was this a cathodic process for you, a chance for you to work through and examine your emotion about your experience? It was catharsis for me. It was memorializing men that I knew, and it was also for one of my students at Scotland. Um, the night before I left Vietnam, someone blew up the barracks I was in. And one of the men who was mortally wounded was a medic that I had known for most of the time I was there. And he died. I was holding him, and he said, tell my daughter. And um, years later I got to Spelman and I had a student in my class and when we got in my world history class and when we got to the Vietnam War, this young lady started to cry. And uh, so, you know, after class she told me my daddy died in Vietnam when I was about in first grade and I never don't remember much about him. And 
we always promised over the years to uh, sit in my office and look at pictures and stuff. She'd seen some of my photos from Vietnam. She says, yeah, they look like my mom's mm -hmm. album. And she was in and out of Spelman for years. She'd go back to New York and come back here. So, um, the weekend before graduation, her and her fiancé came to see me. I was cleaning up the office, getting ready to shut down. And she said, I brought my daddy's pictures. Uh -huh. And I opened the album, and I just started to cry because it was, you know. And she said, whoa, she said, can you tell me about my daddy? Right. So I told her about her daddy, and then I wrote about her daddy and men like him for the book. Right.